I was expecting the day to be, but you never know your luck. It might still come in. I hope you're all managing to keep warm. I've spent the last couple of days um, up at Aldgate, which is uh, significantly colder than it is down here. Um, the McGarry Lectures is really the um, state conference for uh, Churches of Christ ministers, so it was good to catch up with some folk. And um, my, my brain's feeling a little bit fried after, oh, I don't know, eight hours a day of lectures. Uh, so we'll see how we go this morning. Um, we're going to be reading this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, if you have a Bible and want to read along, uh, feel free to do that. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from the NIV. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given the Spirit, uh, through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between Spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one Spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly the desire the greater gifts... And yet I will show you the most excellent way. Let's pray as we come to God's word together. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for your endless love and grace to us every day. Uh, thank you that you have brought us into the body of Christ, that you are forming us and knitting us together as a whole. Thank you for every part of this body. Thank you that you have given us to each other to love and to serve and to build each other up as the body matures 
and we together bring glory to you. My Father, as we look into your word now again, we pray that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Next slide. I've, um, I have this habit. I, I have my, my remote clicker for the PowerPoint and when I finished, I always stick it in my pocket and I forget that it's in my pocket and then I take it home. And when I get home, I take it out of my pocket so that it doesn't go into the wash. And then every Sunday morning, I ring Beck and say, I've forgotten the clicker, can you please bring it? But this morning, I forgot to ring Rebecca. I told you my brain's a little bit fried. So Jessie, uh, Jessie is my clicker this morning. She'll, out, she'll, she'll keep up pretty well. Um, Colossians 1.28 is where we've begun with all of this. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Uh, we've spent a lot of time talking, <laughs> she's good, isn't she, <laughs> talking about this word mature. Uh, the mature person in the ancient world is the wise person and you can see Wisdom is right there in this text. We proclaim him, Jesus, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone, every individual, mature, wise in Christ. Um, there are two parts to the maturing of a person, of course, the maturing of the mind and the maturing of the body. And the ancient philosophers had very little interest in the maturing of the body. They had this understanding of the world uh, that the physical is essentially evil, the spiritual is good. The goal of life is for the spiritual soul within us to transcend the physical. So they weren't interested in the body. Um, but what we've discovered is that this word present is actually significant in our understanding of the maturing of the body as Paul talks about um, the body of Christ as the church. Uh, we find this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He uses the same word there. I feel the divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So when Paul talks about the presenting of the body, this is the image that he's, he's picked up on. Uh, this image seems to have its origin in Ezekiel chapter 16. And in Ezekiel chapter 16, we have this picture of Israel depicted as a discarded infant left in a pool of blood by the side of the road. And God comes along and sees this, this female infant and says to her, Live. Um, as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut. You were not washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. And then as we go through this chapter, uh, what we have is, first of all, a description of the physical maturing of the body. I made you flourish like a plant of the field. You grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed, your hair had grown yet you were naked and bare. And so then God comes to this young Israel and enters into a covenant relationship with her. And in the context of this chapter, the, the, the type of covenant that's being depicted is clearly a covenant of marriage. I passed by you again and saw you, and behold, you were at the age for love. I spread the corner of my garment over you. Um, that might sound a little bit familiar. It sounds a bit like the story of Ruth and Boaz. Uh, Ruth sleeps at his feet, and Boaz puts his uh, cloak over her, and that's uh, a sign. What happens the next day is he agrees to marry her. Um, I made a vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God. And you became mine. And then as we continue through this chapter, we have God washing her, which is sanctification. Then he clothes her, which is glorification. And the end result of the, uh, the sanctification and the glorification is in verse 14. Uh, your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendour that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord. Um, now, this word perfect, when, when they translate it into the, the Greek 
version of the Old Testament. It's this same word that we keep finding in connection with this image of the body in Paul's writing. It's the word mature or complete or finished. The significance of the mature body. Well, uh, the purpose of the union of the man and woman in Genesis chapter 1 is so that God's creational purposes of overcoming the darkness, the emptiness and the chaos um, are fulfilled as uh, God blesses and commissions the man and the woman to be fruitful and to multiply, to fill the earth and bring it into submission to the word and will of God. So what's the significance of the mature body for Christians? We understand the mature mind. The mature mind is the wise mind and it's a wisdom which we can only uh, gain from listening to the word of God and, and particularly the word of Christ in the gospel. The mature mind is the one that, that is rooted in faith, that has matured in hope and finally expresses itself in the perfect love and unity of his people. But what about the body? Because a lot of us, when we became Christians, we already had mature bodies. So the maturing of the body is not about this thing here. The maturing of the body is obviously uh, the body of the church. Um, in Ephesians chapter 5, we saw uh, that Paul refers back to the story of creation in chapter 2, where he quotes from chapter 2, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. This is the mega mystery. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So what he's telling us here is that that picture of the union of the man and woman in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 prefigures the union of Christ and his church. What's the significance then of the mature body of the church? What does the mature body look like? Well, the body needs to mature so that in its union with Christ, we can be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Um, now, Paul uses this image of the body in four of his letters, in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14, in Romans 12, Ephesians 4 and 5, and Colossians 1 and 3. And as you look at these four uh, passages, there are, there's an awful lot of parallels that run through them. I suspect that there are more than I uh, am going to show you here, but for now we'll just look at these. In all four passages, we have this word, perfect, complete, finished, mature. We also have the word agape, love, um, really central to the whole thought. We also have a description of, of love in action, I suppose you could say, and, and you, should, uh, you should be able to recite this by heart now from 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 4 to 8. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. I noticed that none of you were saying it with me, but that's okay. I hope it's got into your heads. But we actually find similar descriptions of love in all four passages. Um, in Romans, I'm just going to read verses 11 and 12. Um, Outdo one another in showing honour. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And it actually goes on for the rest of the chapter. The rest of chapter 12, like 1 Corinthians 13, is this description of love in action. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses uh, 1 to 3, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Um, and Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Uh, now, on, uh, uh, so we have that love in action. In three of the four, uh, we also have a description of the gifts. 
um, and how those gifts are supposed to function in the building up of the body. Again, three of the four, we have this word present. It's missing in 1 Corinthians. Um, and then on the last line, I've, I've got sanctification again in three of the four, but um, look, I, I want to say that it's actually present in all four because you find it in 1 Corinthians 11 with the, the discussion about how we participate in the Lord's Supper. Now, I didn't... Well, I did actually because she's got it up there for me. She's good, isn't she? she? She knows what I'm doing better than I do sometimes. She's actually reading my notes ahead, so she no, she's just guessing. No, um, I've stuck it in there. You could say that I'm stretching the boundaries a bit too far by going back into chapter 11, because the reality is, if you look through all of Paul's letters, somewhere you're going to find something about sanctification. But the reason I, I think we can put it there is is this: um, Paul's letter to the Corinthians was written to address a whole series of problems in the church. This is a group of immature Christians who are still trying to work out what it means to live in this new faith. It's a very different life that they've been called to, a completely different way of thinking and living. They still haven't become mature in the wisdom of God. In other words, they, they don't really know how to express this faith that they have in everyday life. They're not living as those whose hope is first and foremost to do with the return of Christ and, um, and eternal life, and they're certainly failing in their love for each other. And so as you go through the letter, he addresses each of these issues in turn. It begins with the problem of uh, division, as people in the church are lining themselves up behind various apostles. I follow Paul, I follow uh, Peter, I follow Apollos, and the really spiritual ones... I follow Christ. He then talks about problems of sexual immorality in the church, uh, lawsuits that are being played out in public between church members, uh, marriage, idolatry, food being offered uh, to idols, and the Lord's Supper in chapter 11. Now, as you come to some of these topics, Paul introduces them with a, with a very simple introductory statement, now about food offered to idols. Now about marriage. And it could look like that he is just um, almost, here, here is the box of problems and I'm just going to pick one out randomly and we'll deal with that. But that's actually not the way he's written the letter at all. The letter's very carefully constructed and as he deals with one issue, he introduces principles which will help us deal with the next issue. So there's a progression of thought as you read through this letter. And as we come to chapter 12 and he deals with um, spiritual gifts, as we've heard, he has already um, been talking about the body. Uh, the first time he mentions the body is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where he says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Um, in the context, uh, the little heading in the NIV for this section is flee from sexual immorality. And in this section, Paul introduces an, I an idea to us which is really foreign to us as 21st century Westerners. It's the concept of corporate sin. Uh, we are so individualistic in our thinking that, that this can be a little bit uncomfortable for us. But I'll just pick it up from verse 13. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Now to begin with, Paul's saying something there which in, in, the, in the cultural context of Corinth must have been really hard for them to swallow. God cares about the body. In this hyper-spiritual view of the universe that they had, the body doesn't matter. And there were sort of two responses in, in the Gentile church to, to this idea that the body doesn't matter. Either you have to completely suppress the body 
because everything about the body is evil, so do not taste, do not touch, do not smell. Or it doesn't matter what you do with the body because it's going to be destroyed one day anyway. Well, Paul agrees with that. God will destroy the body. But that's not the end of the story for you. Christ raised, uh, God raised Christ's body from the grave. You can see where this is going in chapter 15. One day, he will raise your body. The body matters. The body is important. The physical world that God created is very dear to him. He loves his creation. So he goes on, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Members? In, in what sense members? We're all members of an organisation here, but members of the body in this sense, the arms and the legs and the fingers and the toes and the eyes and the ears and the mouth, the, the different parts, the, the members of the body. You are members of the body of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Now, Paul's addressing the problem of sexual immorality in the church. He's speaking in a very diplomatic way, talking about himself. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her, for it is written, the two shall become one flesh. He's saying something quite extraordinary here. I, as a member of the body of Christ, am joined to every one of you. And I can't extract myself from you when I decide to go and act sinfully. The example given here is, um, an offensive and extreme one, but if I, as your pastor, went and visited a prostitute, I would be taking you all with me. So the body is corporate. You are all a part of the body. You are all joined to Christ, and through Christ you are all joined to each other. He who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin uh, a, a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And down in verse 19, this image of the body, uh, he comes back to it again. Uh, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now, if you have, that was the ESV, if you have an NIV in front of you, you might notice that it's actually quite different. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Um, the commentators suggest that it can be translated either way. Um, but do you not know that your, your is plural, your body singular is a temple singular of the Holy Spirit within you plural, whom you have from God? Um, I think the ESV is right, particularly because he's already spoken about the corporate nature of the body earlier. It's not that your body individually is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's that you corporately are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Body and temple, by the way, are parallel images that Paul uses for the church. You mature the body, you build the temple. You'll see that language come up um, in 1 Corinthians 14 when we get there. Uh, now, the next place that Paul talks about the body is in chapters 8 to 10, where he's dealing with the issue of food that's being offered to idols. And a very brief summary, um, there's nothing in an idol, so eat the food. But when you get to chapter 10, that's a very quick summary of two chapters. In chapter 10, don't participate in the worship. 
all food in the ancient world was offered to idols, but you bought it in the marketplace. So go into the marketplace, just like we go into Coles and we buy halal meat. Doesn't matter, it's been offered to Allah. Buy it in the supermarket, that's not your problem. But for goodness sake, don't go into a mosque and participate in one of their feasts. Don't go into the temple of Aphrodite and participate in the feasts. And he, he, he goes on to explain why it's a problem by starting with what we do in communion. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? So this is why you don't go into the temple and participate at the altar because you're participating with demons. Don't go there, don't do that. Eat the food bought from the supermarket, don't go and participate in the feasts. And then in verse 17, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share in the one loaf. Bread, body, we participate in the bread we are participating together in the body of Christ. Now, the, the problem that he's addressing uh, in chapter 11, where we get to uh, the Lord's Supper, he's, he's addressing a different kind of division that's taking place in the church. And um, so verses 20 and 21 in chapter 11, he says, When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. This isn't the same kind of division that you see earlier in, Corinth, uh, in Corinthians where they're all lining up behind different apostles. This is the division that's come about because they're simply failing to love one another as they should. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? And what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. So you have this situation where it looks like the, the wealthy members of the congregation are coming along with their picnic baskets and sitting in the corner and, and having a nice meal to themselves while the poor in the congregation are sitting in the corner with nothing to eat. So it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Even if you do the little ceremony where you take a piece of bread and share it and you take the cup and you share it, you're not participating in the Supper of the Lord. You're despising the church of God. And what is the church? The church is his body. So then he goes on to, to say the words that we're also very familiar with. I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. I don't mean to be reading these in, this in a, in a flippant voice. So sorry if it's coming across that way. I'm trying to rush through it. You, you, you know these words. We hear them every week. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so then we get to this point. Whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now, we get the parallel, bread, cup, body, blood. But I'm fairly certain that there's a little play on words going on here. You might remember when we talked about uh, Genesis chapter 2 that the, uh, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Flesh and bone in Hebrew is an idiom which means family. In English we have the idiom flesh and blood. You are my flesh and blood. You are my family. Well, in Greek the idiom is body and blood. The problem is that they're denying the church... Eating and drinking in an unworthy manner in the context of this chapter is failing to discern 
the church of Christ. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Um, Verse 27 says, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Sinning against the body and blood. The bread and the cup, the body and the blood. But as I said, there's a play on words going on here. You're denying the body of Christ. You're denying the family of God. And so in verse 29 he says, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Do you notice there's something missing in this line? It says nothing about failing to discern the blood. You're failing to discern the body. You are the body. And so if you fail to discern the body by pretending to come to this love feast, celebrating uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but you're denying the ones in the corner for whom he died, then you're not discerning the body. It's not that you're failing to recognise if we were in a, in a Catholic or a Lutheran setting, it's not that we're failing to mention the real presence in the host. It's not that the body of Christ somehow manifests itself in the piece of bread. You're failing to discern the body for which Christ sacrificed his body. And so that is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. If you neglect the body, the body suffers. Now all of that leads up to the discussion of the spiritual gifts in chapter 12. You think, boy, that was a long introduction. I don't want to speak a whole lot on the spiritual gifts. Uh, But now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters... I do not want you to be uninformed. Actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave it there today. We'll, we'll come back and pick it up again next week. Um, what I'll finish with is simply this. If you can flick down to the last slide there, Jesse. In 1 Corinthians 12.27... He writes, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Now God has placed you all here as a gift to each other. He has equipped every one of us. He's given us gifts so that we can use those gifts in love to build each other up. But he finishes this chapter having addressed all of the spiritual gifts by saying, eagerly desire the greater gifts, but I'll show you a more excellent way. And the more excellent way is the way of love of chapter 13. We don't use the gifts that God has given us to build ourselves up and make something of ourselves. We use the gifts that God has given us to build each other up, to build up the body of Christ as a whole so that we bring glory to him and not to ourselves. Now, I'd be very tempted to say that love is the platform on which the gifts manifest themselves. But as you read through 1 Corinthians, that's clearly not right. The gifts are manifesting themselves amongst the Corinthians even as they completely fail to love each other. The gifts are the working of the Spirit. They're called in faith. The Spirit comes upon them um, and the gifts are there. So it would be better to say that love is the principle by which the gifts function properly and operate fruitfully in the church as the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. 
and each one of you is a part of it. God has gifted every one of us so that the church functions fruitfully as a whole, but that will only happen if we are mature in love. So whatever gift you have, whether it's an exciting gift like teaching or prophesying or healing or a boring one like administration, use it in love to glorify God and to build up each other so that the body of Christ united to Christ is fruitful and multiplies and fills the earth and we overcome an earth that's in rebellion against God. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have brought us into the body of your Son. Help us to love each other as we should. Help us to use our gifts in service to each other and to you, Um, always looking for ways in which we can uh, exercise those gifts in love. Thank you for, uh, for this congregation. Thank you for our musicians, for our Sunday school leaders, our youth leaders, our evangelists, our... Uh, our maintenance crew, our electricians and window makers and gardeners and uh, card makers and preachers and just, Father, thank you for all of these people. Thank you that you've brought us together and you're knitting us together into one body with Christ as the head. And we pray that as we focus on him, as we devote ourselves to your Son, that you would cause us to be fruitful and to multiply as we long to see the word of your gospel transform the lives of those in this world who are lost and without hope. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Another, you get another opportunity to praise God now. Please stand and, um, yeah, worship with us.